be seated. We'll be going through uh, Isaiah 63, 7 through 9, and Matthew 2, 13 through 23. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel, that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely there they are my people, children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior. In all their distress, it was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them as the days of old. Matthew 2, 13 through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As we hear that part of the Christmas story that we often overlook, We go very quickly into the Magnificat, or the Song of Mary, the Song of Zechariah. We we sing a lot of songs at Christmas time. But when we come to this passage where Joseph had to take Mary and the newborn Jesus into Egypt, we understand that something a little different took place there. So we ask some questions. Uh, What is a refugee? Well, the modern definition of a refugee is a person who has been forced to leave their country in order to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. We could ask, what causes refugees? What makes refugees? Well, they're fleeing war, persecution, or natural disaster. So when those things take place, refugees are created. Whenever there is something in a land where people want to escape to preserve life, refugees are born. The most important question for us today, though, is what is the Christian response to refugees? And we'll look at that in a minute. But as we look at this specific story, up on the screen you'll see a tree, and it's called the Tree of the Virgin Mary. And it is in uh, Cairo, Egypt. And there are many epitaphs and instructions as well as historical sources to testify that there was a thriving Jewish um, expatriate community there in Egypt. And it was made up of refugees who had come there earlier that could be joined by others. But just like today, new refugees were not welcome. And a, a letter of the Imperial Claudius that was written in the year 41 CE, it says that Jews in Alexandria lived in a city not of their own in which they were not to bring or invite any more Jews to come and live with them. So history, not that it needs to, but history supports the claim of the scriptures. A, rem- a remembrance of Jesus' family in Egypt is preserved here 
in Matira, in the suburbs of Cairo, at Hillopolis. It's a spot understood to be a stopping place on the Holy Family's flight, and it's probably the most important site in the world for anyone wanting to just kind of think about Joseph, Mary, and Jesus as refugees. For new refugees, as anywhere, life would have been very hard. The first century Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria tells us that the consequences of poverty, which could result in enslavement. So you go as a refugee, you, you're looking for the kindness of others, and if you can't get your life put together quickly, you are then taken as a slave. So presumably Jewish charity and voluntary giving through a synagogue would have been the, the way that Mary and Joseph were able to stay out of slavery and would have been there to help a struggling refugee family. But they would have also totally been reliant on the kindness of strangers. Joseph would have tried to find work as a tecton or a fix-it man. It's translated often as carpenter, but he had more skills than just working with wood. He could, he could fix anything, probably. It probably said out there in Nazareth, you know, Joseph's fix-it shop or something like that, where Jesus learned uh, his father's trade. But there in Egypt, he would have been looking for things like that to try and put food on the table for his family. The legacy of being a refugee and a newcomer to a place is being far from home. It's something that I think really we can see how authentic it is by what Jesus said later in his life, by the things that he taught and how he taught them and who he taught them to. When he set off on his mission, he took up the life of a displaced person. He says in Matthew 8.20 that he was a person with no place to lay his head. He asked those who acted for him to go out without a bag or change of clothing, essentially to walk along the roadside like a destitute refugee who had suddenly fled, relying on the generosity and the hospitality of ordinary people for those villages that they entered. And it was the villagers' welcome, or not, to poor wanderers who showed up that showed what side they were on. And Jesus said in Mark 6, If any place will not receive you and refuse to hear you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony for them. Refugees often get overlooked because of the climate that has caused their refugee status. Oftentimes the struggle between nations or warring factions causes a dangerous situation and people looking for strength or comfort or peace or safety often overlook the humanity of the faces of the people that we're talking about. We did have a similar situation in this country in the 1940s at the height of World War II. And the United States had a policy that from 38 to 41, we would receive a handful of, of Jewish refugees from Germany and from the Austria area. But there was no effort specifically to find them and, and save them. Now, early 1944, the U.S. changed its, its policy and actively went to try and find and save as many as they could. The problem was that the Holocaust went from 1941 to 1945. And so as we talk about the faces of the refugees and we talk about the humanity and the compassion, it is also to remember that we do the best that we can with what we are given. And what we are given is a voice. And what we are given is compassion. The, the reminder I will give to you about that time in our history is a couple of very, very important people came from one of those ships. A man by the name of Albert Einstein was a Jewish refugee that the United States welcomed, as was Elie Wiesel, who was a survivor of Auschwitz. And he would go on to win numerous awards and be a constant reminder to us of the atrocities of war and genocide. But what if Jesus was born today? What if he was born to two parents of little means? Well, if he was born in the U.S., and that's really small. Sorry about that. If he was born in the U.S., he'd look something like that. They are actually um, Latinos, and they're standing outside of the convenience store. She is sitting on a, one of those penny-operated little horses instead of a donkey, and her sweatshirt says Nazareth High School. You remember Mary was very young. Um, Joseph has a work shirt on from a garage, and it says Jose. And he's got the phone book out, and he's calling on the telephone trying to find a place for them to stay for the baby to, to be born. Um, there's a cigarette ad up by his head that says three wise men. And then over in the corner, 
at the hotel sign, it says, um, looking for basically a new manager, and it says manger because one of the letters dropped out. So it's a, it's a shocking thing, and it's not meant to say that Jesus was Latino. We know what nationality Jesus was. We know what Jesus looked like for the most part because we know that people from different regions look and speak and act differently. But at Christmas time, we always get so comfortable with hearing the story over and over again that we just continue to reinforce aspects of the story. So we have to step outside of the story from time to time to say, if it happened today, how would we, how would we welcome them? If they were in our midst, what would that look like? If it took place elsewhere, the birth of Jesus, it might look something more like this. And this is more culturally relevant to the way Jesus would have looked and more true to the kind of family that he was born into as they were fleeing, as these persons on the screen are fleeing Aleppo, Syria, after the atrocities of genocide, trying to just save his wife and child with an ivy bag held in his hand. What if Christ had come like this? Would we have welcomed him? When we see the Bible stories accurately modeled in our world today, it's meant to inspire and to challenge us on how we use our gifts and, most importantly, how we see others. It's meant to help us look at others with compassion. It's helping us to see that these people are real. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were real people, and God loves all real people. I've been to Bethlehem, and I have seen this wall firsthand. It's the wall meant to separate the Palestinians and the Israelis. And I just put it there, um, put this picture there, as that's the path that Mary and Joseph are taking to Bethlehem. And they can't get there because the wall is separating Israel and Palestine. The coming of the Prince of Peace only makes sense if things are in conflict or there's even war. Otherwise, it doesn't make any difference to us. If we're, if we're at peace, if, if things aren't turned upside down in our lives, the promise of a Prince of Peace is nothing more than quaint. Well, that's nice. That's nice. How we picture Jesus determines how we see ourselves, and it determines how we see others. So what is the Christian response to refugees? The first, I think, that the first thing that has to happen is that we stop throwing people around in categories that changes how we treat them. To God, there are no categories of humanity. There's no one group that's better than other or one group of humans that's more human than others. For God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. And second, to follow Jesus and to love each other, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and specifically targeting the least among us, that when we do so, that is following Christ. And during this time of great need in our communities, generosity is truly a mark of the Christian life. And as we celebrate the salvation that comes with the gift of Christ. We pray for new eyes and new hearts that we might see those in need in our midst and around the world and that we might seek ways to make a difference, that we might be ambassadors for peace and love and compassion. To truly celebrate Christmas, we have to connect with the mission of the baby that was born to reach, to save the least, the last, and the lost. I, f I saw a very interesting thing this week that was posted, and it was that the family category for plants that the poinsettia is, you know, the poinsettia that we, we, we go to the store and we see the pretty displays, like, yep, that's going on the table, and that'll be very beautiful, and it's a tropical plant, so we typically can't keep them alive, and, but they're, they're great, and they're beautiful, and that red and the green, it's gorgeous. But that plant is in the same category as the plant that created or bore the crown of thorns. They're in the same grouping. Christmas, Good Friday, it's all part of the same story. 
Now what is wonderful is that we do get feast days, and we get celebration, and we do get time to take a breath and to cherish the things in life that are important. Grandchildren, loved ones, friends. So we shouldn't lose those things. But let us not lose perspective on the whole of the story as we make merry and we celebrate. Let us remember that this, it is part of the same story and that this joy is part of the saving purpose of Jesus Christ that God brought on this, on this planet for our sake. When we are among that group that is in need, let us rejoice that God loves us. And when we are even among the group with the means to do the helping, may we help and may we serve with gladness and compassion. May we celebrate this Christmas season. May we be thankful for our blessings. And may we be mindful of those in our midst and for the needs that we, through generosity, can meet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.